Dr. Rod Roger McIntyre. Dr. Rod Roger McIntyre is the professor of psychiatry and pharmacology at the University of Toronto and head of the mood disorders psychopharmacology unit at the University Health Network in Ontario. He has a huge list of accreditation. So I'll go through a few just so you can know some of the, um, the wonderful work that he is doing. He's um, executive director of the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation, uh, which many, have, uh, many of you would have seen in our group um, with the uh, posters and, and uh, surveys that, that are going through the group. Dr. McIntyre is also uh, co-chair of the Scientific Advoid Advisory Board of Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance from Chicago, Illinois. He's also professor at Nan Xuan Scholar Xuan Zhu Medical University um, and adjunct professor college, the University of Korea. Dr. McIntyre is clinical professor State University, New York Upstate Medical University, Syracuse, and Clinical Professor, Department of Psychiatry and Neurosciences, University of California School of Medicine, Riverside, California, USA. He's a founder of the Canadian Rapid Treatment Center of Excellence and CEO of Braxia Scientific Court, Corp. Um, he was also been named by Clar Claravate Analytics in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. Um, this distinction is given by publishing a large number of articles that rank among the most frequently cited by researchers globally. Um, 21 broad fields of science and social science during the previous decade. He's published over 740 articles, has edited and co-edited several textbooks on mood disorders. So we are very privileged and honored to have you to speak with us today. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be talking about your study um, of long COVID and brain fog. Uh, Susie, great to be with you again, and thank you, and hello to all of our colleagues who are joining us. I know that the appetite for knowledge in this area is vast. Uh, our, our top doctor, Dr. Uh, Tam, has identified long COVID as a serious problem in Canada. Uh, Statistics Canada is doing a survey right now looking at how common this problem is in Canada. I am delighted to see the federal government recognizing how serious and debilitating this problem is. Best estimates, as you know, Susie, at least 10%, up to 50 to 60% of people are having features of long COVID. And um, you know, most estimates coming in around maybe 20, 30%. I think we haven't fully uh, understood what's going on here, what's causing this. We know it's very problematic. You mentioned brain fog, Susie. As you know, very, very well, Susie, patients have terrible, terrible fatigue, uh, difficulty getting going, get tired very quickly around the house doing chores, things like that. Very simple tasks, make people exhausted. And they have a bunch of physical symptoms. So we have a study, Susie, as you know, it's the first study that we're aware of ever designed like this, uh, where we're testing a treatment to help people who are suffering from long COVID. And you have to be 18 years of age or older, be a resident in Canada, and showing some degree of uh, slowness, brain fog, mental slowing uh, since you've had COVID. Don't hesitate. There's the email address right there in the phone number. Long COVID, easy to remember, at bcdfoundation.ca or 647-450-8045. You might be eligible to be part of a study. Susie, you know the study well. I know we got lots of questions people want to ask. And this is a great opportunity for the next uh, 25 minutes or so for us to go through it all. Right, so we wanted to start off asking uh, why the study for vortioxetine for the brain was chosen. Why yeah, that selection? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great place to start, Susie. Very, very simply. I sat back and I thought to myself, uh, what are the most common symptoms? The most common, not the only, but some of the most common and really problematic symptoms amongst people having long COVID, Susie, as you know, people have a lot of brain fog. Their mind's just really foggy. They, they just can't think very clearly. Secondly, people are just exhausted. They're fatigued. They just have no energy. And thirdly, a lot of people were telling us, you know, I just, life's just not as good for me. I'm just not able, my quality of life is really reduced. I can't function. 
And we don't know what's causing all of this, but we think something about the immune system is playing some role. Uh, we're still trying to suss all that out. So we went through our drop down menu of potential treatments. We came up with this medicine, Vortioxetine. For those who are less familiar, it's a drug that's used to treat depression, but we're not suggesting that COVID, long COVID is depression. It, we're, we're what we call repurposing it. We're using it for another reason. Why this one? because this one has been shown to improve brain fog in other conditions. It's been shown to really improve energy and motivation in other areas. And it's also been shown to really improve quality of life and function, and it's an anti-inflammatory. So we thought that's really interesting. So maybe we should actually test it. And that's why we chose this one in our study. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think it was the right one to go with. Great, thanks. Uh, what are the mechanisms mechanisms of action behind vortioxetine as it relates to cognitive function? Yeah, really great question. You know, I would start off by saying that it's complicated. These things tend to be complicated indeed. Um, but we have been, begun to unravel some of the answer to that question. And what's interesting is that, uh, among other things, uh, vortioxetine affects chemicals in the brain that we know are really, really important for cognition. And cognition in, in really just refers to thinking. It refers to your, your processing speed. In other words, that Pentium chip that's in your head, how fast you can process things and how sharp your memory is and how much you can pay attention. All of that uh, basic function that we all know, we depend on it every day is cognition and vortioxine targets the neurochemistries. Now the neurochemistries, frankly, Susie, it's a bit like a symphony at the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. There's all kinds of instruments that are playing a role in the melody. Uh, but we do know dopamine, which many people have heard of, plays a role here. Uh, inflammation, in other words, it can reduce inflammation. And there's another one which is really important to the symphony called glutamate. These are big words, all kinds of neurochemistry. But the gist of it is these chemistries play a role in brain fog and cognition and motivation. And so in many ways, uh, we sort of see 40 oxy as kind of a symphony. It actually has different instruments that are touching on different tunes that create this really nice melody of improving cognition, motivation, energy, and frankly, at the end of the day, quality of life and people's function. So that's, our fingers are crossed. This is gonna help you. Right. And so we, you talked a bit about the causes of, of brain fog, but are there, is it, is it known that it's inflammation that's causing the brain fog? Do we know more well, now? Well, you know, Susie, the way I think about it, I use a lot of metaphors, as you know, and I sort of think about this as a, as a crime. And we're down at the police station, there's many suspects in the suspect line. And I would say in that suspect line, inflammation certainly is a suspicious character. We, we really think that what's happening is what we call friendly fire. In other words, you got infected by COVID, your immune system has stepped up to the plate. It's helped you uh, resolve the virus, if you will, in the sense of the acute viral infection. That's the good news. But there's a bit of friendly fire here. In other words, what's happened is the immune system has been so uh, activated that unfortunately it remains activated for longer than we would like it to be. And then on top of that, uh, the virus is largely under control. This thing's still this thing's still stoked up. So we're seeing, in fact, collateral damage. And what happens in the brain, Susie, is that when the immune system has been activated, especially activated for a considerable period of time, weeks and months, we start to see some collateral damage. In other words, in the brain, we've done some of this research ourselves, we begin to see changes in certain parts of the brain. And when we looked at this more closely, we discovered that those areas of the brain where some of that damage takes place is exactly the area we depend on to think. It's exactly the same area we depend on for our energy, our motivation, and how much we enjoy life. So it was a very interesting set of observations. This is why we think inflammation is playing a role. I don't think it's the only suspect in the suspect line. There's some other suspects that we are looking at. Um, but in fact, there's about four or five of them to be perfectly frank with you. Um, but we really think this is a major one. So if that's the case, then it stands to reason we need a treatment that can 
reset the, the immune system. And, and we've got a reason scientifically to believe that this drug 40 oxygen could do that. That's a hypothesis. We're trying to test this, but it's not a hypothesis out of the deep blue sky. This is a hypothesis based on some work that was done previously with the medication. And we already know that this medication can improve people's thinking. In fact, the FDA, the United States Food and Drug Administration, has already recognized this drug improves cognitive functions in people who have depression. Again, that's a separate ball game, depression than COVID, but we, we, we we're crossing our fingers that we can copy and paste that benefit over to long COVID. That along with the fact that this drug has also been shown to make people more motivated, feeling like life is worth living and people feel more get up and go. And this is what people are really struggling with who have COVID. So we thought it was, as I said, a no brainer. This is the one to go with. We got to test it. It's kind of a logical candidate. It has all those check boxes, if you will. And, um, and uh, so far, you know, Susie, we're, we're recruiting a, a couple hundred people in our study. I would encourage people to really sign up quickly if they want, because recruitment's going very, very quickly. Uh, unfortunately, many people have this problem and there's not any, you know, proven strategy just yet. But I think the symptoms that I'm speaking to, uh, Susie, I think they really resonate because I think that's what's bothering people the most. Thank you. Yes, I think you're right. Um, as far as the design of the research study, if people are wanting to get involved, what can they uh, anticipate? Uh, what kind of tests will the participants yeah. be given? Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, look, we know that you know life is busy. People are busy. We like to make this uh, uh, very easy. And don't hesitate, just email colleagues on the email you can see on the screen right now or give them a phone call. And uh, unlike calling the airlines where no one answers the phone, uh, you know, you, you'll get someone answering the phone there. They're gonna call you back uh, very promptly with me, usually means within the workday. And really, in fact, what I wanna emphasize is it's, it's a fairly uh, low intensity involvement. In other words, you don't come into a hospital, you're not staying for two weeks or six weeks in a hospital. It's done as an outpatient. Um, and, 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 and what we also try to do, we try to keep the visits brief. Thirdly, what we also try to do, uh, Susie, is again, we know people are busy. So to the extent possible, a lot of the questionnaires and so on can be done online. So it really makes it very efficient. Now, the gist of it is, if you meet the criteria and the team will meet with you promptly, usually within one business day, they'll chat with you, set something up, determine your eligibility. If you are eligible, they'll go through an eligibility checklist with you. Um, and when going through that, if you meet the criteria, you'll start right away. And what will happen is, is that for the most part, Susie, you don't need to stop uh, you know, your usual medications. If you're taking medications for medical problems, this and that, we just add it to it. You'll see our team, you'll see one of our family docs who works within the study and you'll have visits. It's, it's a it's an eight week study and, and there'll be uh, measurement taking throughout uh, that time. And <clears throat> we'll, we're particularly interested, obviously, in how well people are thinking or how much they're imp impaired with brain fog. And then what we're going to do is, is we're going to look at the change in that outcome across time. Now, this is what we call a placebo controlled study. Uh, uh, Susie, just to clarify, because some people may not know what that actually means. I think it's that may be familiar to some people, but maybe not others. So what happens is, is that we're not going to know. It's blinded. We're not going to know. The person's not going to know what they're on. But you're going to get a placebo or you're going to get the medication for eight weeks. And, and the reason why I've been asked, well, why, why do you have that? Why doesn't everyone just get the medication? Well, the government of Canada, the government of the United States, governments around the world, they insist on us doing it this way because we won't know if someone getting better is because the condition's just getting better on its own, or is it getting better because of the medication? We're not gonna know unless we have a placebo. And so it serves as what we call the control. And so um, um, we have that in there. Now, you know, uh, people can enroll and we like people to stay to the, to the end eight weeks. Most people do it, no problem. Uh, but, you know, obviously people can bail out whenever they want, but we would like people to, to stay at the end, you know, and what have you. People's best interests are always prioritized first. So I think, in fact, the best thing is to reach out, touch base with the team, um, very responsible, very responsive. You'll they'll get back with one business day 
And look, we, we've been talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, Susie, people got lots of individual, very personal questions they wanna ask that pertain to their situation. Those individual one-off type situations can be addressed with the team, no problem at all. Great, and I remember when the, the, uh, it, the study first got up, it was um, only available in Toronto. It's available Canada-wide now, is it not? It is. What a great point, Susie. That's such a great point. Um, it is. Um, it's, it's available Canada-wide. And uh, it, look, we like to make this North American-wide even bigger, quite frankly, because look, this is affecting the whole planet. But for a whole bunch of reasons, largely just logistical, frankly, we've tried to keep it to Canada. So folks on the line today who are joining us outside of the GTA, that is within the province of Ontario, or who are joining us outside of uh, the province of Ontario, all the way out to uh, not just Maritime Canada, but Atlantic Canada, and all through the prairies and all through the West, you could be potentially eligible. There's ways we can make it work. Of course, now with virtual assessments and uh, uh, in, in ways that we can liaise with you, work with you, we can make it happen <clears throat> where we can actually have the measures done virtually and have the treatment actually delivered to your home. Um, so you would not necessarily need to come to Toronto if you live outside of the, under the province. Now we do like people to come in person. It's certainly preferred um, to have it done that way. That's the preference, but we recognize that there's a Look, this is a new, a new world. We all know what telehealth looks like and televideo and all that. People may be seeing their doctor or their nurse this way for other reasons. So I don't think it's, it's a, a mystery anymore what this is. And we're trying to be as pragmatic as we can. We're also trying to be, of course, uh, cost, uh, cost disciplined in how we do the studies. Uh, so having it in person is a bit better for us, but we can certainly make accommodations for those who can't make it in person to come downtown Toronto and meet with us at our center. Great, thank you. Now we have quite a few questions in our chat. Are you ready to address some of the questions that our members <clears throat> absolutely, have? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I'm just getting so, warmed up. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> okay. Um, as you were talking about placebo, there's a question about placebo here. I'm interested in participating in the study, but I'm worried I will get placebo and waste eight weeks of my time. Great point. Do you want to, you want to know what, Susie? I get all kinds of people asking me, hey, Roger, what should I invest in? Electric vehicles? Should I invest in, oh, I don't know, crypto? I always, uh, to be tongue in cheek, I always say invest in placebo. And they say, what the heck are you talking about? I say invest in placebo because it really works. It's getting better and better. Where I'm going with this, placebo is not no treatment. The FDA recognizes placebo actually works. That's actually why we have it. We're, we're trying to show the medication can work even better. So in fact, if you come and you're deemed to be eligible, you want to be in the study, you get assigned to placebo, you're not getting nothing. You're going to be seeing our team and whatnot and so on. And quite frankly, I've been doing clinical research for 25 years. Placebo is not just nothing. You're going to be seeing our dream. We're going to be going through a variety of tests and so on. And that in itself, that in itself might help some of the symptoms. That's why we have placebo in the study, because placebo is not no treatment. Now, our hope is, is that the medication works even better. That's the whole purpose. But placebo is not no treatment. And certainly there's no obligation. If people are going through the study, they're not happy with the way they feel or things are you know, their, look, their health is number one, their, their, their overall health care is number one, um, their, their research is a distant second, believe me, so people can exit the study anytime. But uh, certainly, in fact, the point's well taken, but I want to make that point strong. Placebo works very, very well. Uh, we're just trying to show the medication works even better. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is about a PCR test. Is a positive PCR test result required to uh, participate in the study? And also, can people who became ill with COVID during wave one and who are still symptomatic participate? Absolutely great question. Let me take the, the, the second question first. Wave one, wave two, wave three, four. What, how many waves are we in now, Susie? I've lost count. Um, yeah. But whatever the wave is we're in right, we were recent, I forgot the number now. Uh, any wave counts, believe me, doesn't matter. Uh, if you've got long COVID, according to the team, then you're, that's, that's, that you would be eligible. Second is uh, you can come in with, you know, some people are not vaccinated, many are vaccinated now, of course. Uh, if you've had breakthrough infection on a vaccine, 
you're also eligible. So we're, we're being very open. We're not sort of putting too many filters on this. So if it was the first wave way back in 2020, my goodness, time flies. Um, any wave, if you vaccine or no vaccine, Omicron, Delta, BA4, whatever, BA5, doesn't matter what vaccine you took, not a problem. Um, the first question was, just let my mind get to, what was the first part of that question? Um, oh, just if, if a positive PCR test. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, absolutely. So what we would like people to have is a uh, documentation you had COVID. Speak to the team. Um, in other words, it could be, you know, you had test PCR antigen test positive. Um, we recognize that early in this pandemic that for many people, they didn't get a test and it was pretty clear they had COVID, but they may not have had a test. I mean, let's face it, go back to the early days of the pandemic. We didn't have a lot of testing going on back then and people clearly had COVID. Um, and so we certainly allow for a healthcare provider uh, uh, diagnosing it in the absence of a test. We prefer the test, uh, but we recognize that that didn't happen for a lot of people or it's just not available anymore. And we recognize that. We don't want people to uh, be compromised for that reason. So we, we can make a combination. We do like a healthcare provider to have acknowledged the condition. Um, some people we've met, Susie, they don't have the test. Uh, they clearly had COVID. Maybe they, they don't have a regular doctor or nurse. They can't find someone to give them that note. Talk to the team. There's different ways that we can kind of do our detective work just to kind of um, make it clear that you do have COVID. So there's ways that we can do uh, workarounds. Um, and the team is re really good at doing this. And so just talk to them. But we would prefer, we would prefer, but we recognize it's not always available, some type of test and or a care provider saying, yeah, you know, you had the condition. If you don't have either one of those, um, don't, uh, don't uh, frustrate, just call the team. We, we got a few workaround strategies that we've developed in those scenarios. Great. Okay, the next one is a uh, question. Let's see here. Over the, my, over the past year and a bit, my doctor has tried various other antidepressants for off-label treatment for long COVID without much success. What makes this one potentially more promising than others? Well, that's a really nice question. And effectively, that's the process that I was marinating in my head for the longest time. And <clears throat> I always say, Susie, it's easier to believe what's believable. In other words, I would likely believe a treatment's likely to work if it's believable. And what's believable is a treatment that has already demonstrated itself to be a drug that can reduce brain fog, a drug that can improve your motivation and reduce your fatigue, and a drug that can improve your quality of life and function and behave as an anti-inflammatory. Now, quite frankly, what I just listed there, that's not something I can say about many medicines. And uh, so, so it's not that any medication is likely to work here. Um, you need to have a medication that has through good science shown to benefit the key symptoms that are debilitating for people who got long COVID, brain fog, fatigue, no motivation, things like that. And as I said earlier, we have a reason to believe that something's wrong with the immune system. That's what's playing a role here, maybe not the whole role, but at least some, at least some you know, support actor role. And, um, and this drug does that. So, so it was a very painstaking process as we were marinating internally. Um, what would be the appropriate medicine to consider? It has to be safe. It has to be a drug that's easy to take, very well tolerated. But it also has to be a drug that can really deliver on those key check boxes that I listed. And frankly, the number of medicines that can do that, the way I described it, first of all, when I was thinking about it in my head, I thought, oh, I'm asking for too much. No medication can actually do that. And then we started looking at it and said, well, actually, this one can do that. And we have a lot of experience with it in other areas. We said, well, let's try it. We, we considered quite a few, but that was the one we landed on. And um, so if you've tried something else for long COVID, this is a really nice point. Um, that's obviously frustrating. Keep in mind that there's very few treatments that are able to target all these key aspects like this one does that I described. Now, there's no guarantee. That's why we're doing the study. And the other part is um, 
keep in mind, if you got a headache and you take Tylenol and your headache doesn't respond to Tylenol, that doesn't mean an aspirin won't help you. So just because one thing doesn't work doesn't mean something else can't work. I understand it's frustrating and it really makes you feel like, you know, like, like kind of hopeless here when things aren't working. But I just want to inject some hopefulness into this that because things haven't worked out with other types of interventions you've tried, that has no bearing on whether or not this one could work. That's just a general statement, but a more specific statement is this one we think has all the check boxes we're looking for in a believable campaign. That's why we believe this one could possibly work. Great, thank you. Now, someone's asking why should they participate in the study as opposed to just getting a prescription from their family doctor? That's a great question. That's a great question. Look, I think at the end of the day, I want to make the point really clear. This is a study. I take the view strongly, uh, Susie, that when it comes to treatment for anything in medicine, don't use anything in medicine unless it's been shown to be safe and shown to be effective. Remember back, Susie, in 2020, when this terrible pandemic started, People were getting on TV saying, oh, they're trying hydroxychloroquine. They're doing all these things to treat COVID. A lot of these things were never shown to work. In fact, some of these things had serious safety concerns. So I take the view, and this is my bias because I'm a psychopharmacologist. I, I work with, with, with meds, with medication. I'm a medication researcher. And I take the view that everything should be proven to be safe first. And secondly, does it work? And I wouldn't recommend anything unless it's safe and or works. And frankly, we don't have a treatment yet that the Health Canada or the FDA has approved for long COVID. So we, we're still stuck into, in, in the research of this. So I wouldn't recommend any treatment for long COVID because nothing in fact has been proven or, or, or endorsed by the FDA or Health Canada. So for now, we're still in the research arena and that's where we should remain until we demonstrate the safety and then does it work. So now, admittedly, a clinical trial is a clinical trial, and you're, you're contributing your time. Hopefully, you benefit, obviously, but the information that we're going to gather is obviously going to help the millions of people who are being bothered by this problem. So it's going to be a contribution to, I guess, uh, your peers, uh, your citizens of the country and around the world, and obviously to science. Great. Well, okay, the next question is about the study. It's been going on for a while now. Have you had any results that you can we, share with us? We sure have. Here's the issue, though. The study started formally. Uh, we, we, we have what we call a soft launch and a hard launch. So we, form, we, we kind of formally started just before the Christmas season, December 2021. But we really got this thing off the ground, really got moving in January. But we did start a few months, about a month before that. But really, we called our, 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 our soft launch and a hard launch was in January. And yeah, as I said, we have a lot of people coming into the study. We know people are getting better, but we're blinded. We don't know what they're on. So we, mm. we can't what we call break the blind until the study is completed. But I can tell you, people are getting better. We're getting all kinds of people write letters to us and emails. Um, and no, I don't know if they're on the drug or not. Maybe they're on placebo. I don't know that. Uh, but we know people are getting better. Um, and that's obviously really awesome to see. That's what it's all about. But I, we won't be breaking the blind until the end of the study. And the end of the study shouldn't be too far away because the recruitment, I mean, people are, are calling us. To, there's a lot of in, interest in being in the study. So, so we'll know at the end of the study. All I can say is people are getting better, but I don't know what they're on. Right. Okay. Uh, so the next one is, could your study doctor provide an update to my family doctor about how I'm doing the study. For example, could your study doctor comment on if there are improvements over the eight week period to their doctor? Yeah, certainly we have a study doctor who's working in our, in our study and the study doctor would certainly be open having a communication with anyone's healthcare provider. Now, the study doctor is a bit like me in the sense that the study doctor is also gonna not necessarily know what somebody's on necessarily. We have ways we can break the blind if we need to under emergency situations, as, and that's expected. Uh, that would be just an ethical requirement. Um, but absolutely, we're, we're, we, we want people to, to get better. That's what this is about. And, and certainly our, our team was happy to liaise or talk to uh, healthcare providers in the community as if people have any questions about their particular care or whatnot. 
we can be made, we, we're, we're happy to speak to colleagues in the community. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next one is, does vortioxine lift the mood and or relieve anxiety, illness? Um, is this something that you've been seeing or that you've seen? Yes and yes, and we're not surprised by that because vortioxetine is a drug that uh, improves depression. It's already indicated for people who have depression in, in Canada, the United States, all around the world, and it really helps anxiety in people as well. Uh, now, that's not the primary reason we're using it, but I'm sure many on the call know that a lot of people who got long COVID, they may not have depression in the sense of a depressive disorder, but they have like they feel kind of depressed as part of long COVID, a lot of anxiety, a lot of those symptoms along with the brain fog and fatigue. And absolutely people are reporting an improvement in that area. But again, I want to be very clear, it is blinded. Um, and uh, so maybe it's the placebo doing it, <coughs> but I don't know that. But I, I would just say, yes, we are seeing improvement in depression and anxiety, <clears throat> but I won't be surprised because vortioxetine improves depression and does improve anxiety. We already knew that anyways before we came into the study. Okay, we're approaching the end here, but there's quite a few more questions. So um, do the same long COVID symptoms occur for everyone? Have people reported some unique symptoms to you? Oh man, that's such a great question. You know, that's a million dollar question. There's people really trying to understand that. Um, so far, Susie, over 200 symptoms have been described as part of COVID. So that's a long drop down menu. Um, there are symptoms that are certainly more common, like fatigue, the brain fog we've been talking about. Um, to be perfectly frank, what's happening right now is people are using these big computers and what's called machine learning to try and look at the data to see if there's kind of subgroups, if you will, just like the question was. And right now we're still on the learning curve, but it's so darn complicated uh, that at least right now we can't say there's this subset or that type of long COVID, but we're seeing some patterns. And now what we're doing, just like when you look at the stars with, a, you know, with, with your telescope, if you increase the magnification, you can kind of see that star better. So the machine learning is helping us really sharpen the telescope so we can see that star in the data to answer that question. But right now it's a little bit kind of complicated. We can't quite see it with our bare eye just yet. Okay, I think there's a good one here about, um, do you explain how this drug could reset, could reset the immune system? What's, what is the mechanism? Yeah, great question. Imagine the immune system like a seesaw, just like a seesaw, okay? So what happens is, is when you get an infection, it's like the seesaw goes in one balance. And imagine if you weigh, say, 100 kilograms, and the other person weighs 100 kilograms, the seesaw is in perfect balance, right? Let's say you wear 100 kilograms, the other person weighs 300 kilograms, well, you have an imbalance, right? That's an imbalance of the system. So the, what happens when you get COVID is that you get that imbalance because what's happened is, is your immune system is trying to help you, but it went into overdrive. It's like this 300 kilogram system and it caused this imbalance. And what happens is vortioxine kind of resets the balance of the seesaw again, because the immune system is a good guy, but the immune system can be a bad guy if it's activated too much for too long. And so it just kind of resets it. And uh, that's what it's doing in the lab. And that's what we think it's gonna do here. And there's a uh, one about side effects. Are there any side effects from the medication? There's always side effects. In fact, 70% of people get side effects on placebo. That's why when people say to me, oh, this drug has no side effects. I say, really? Placebo has got side effects and 70% of people take it. Side effects affects everything in life. The question is, is which side effects are common and which side effects, you know, kind of rain on the parade? Well, we don't see a lot of common side effects, but that's one of the other reasons we chose this one. It has very few side effects. You can get nausea, but it tends to go away after a few days and it doesn't really lead to discontinuation. It's kind of a few days, it's kind of annoying, but it goes away in some people who get it. Most people don't get that. Uh, so uh, 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 it's one of the key reasons we did choose that one because it is quite well tolerated. Okay, this is a good one too. The research, um, does the research target tremors internal vibrations, as these are also part of neurological symptoms, or is the drug, does it have any known effects on this to be so associated with neurological symptoms? 
What a great question. That's a great question. Uh, can I add to it, Susie? Some people get palpitations, shortness of breath, other types of symptoms with their you know, GI and bladder, things like that. This drug is not primarily in, uh, uh, considered for that. Um, we think it's gonna help the things we talked about, the brain fog, the fatigue, the tiredness, the lack of motivation, the decreased quality of life, people's mood symptoms. Sleep. sleep for sure, absolutely, sleep for sure as well. But will it help some of those like taste and smell and neurologic symptoms? I would say maybe. It won't, we don't know that it hurts it. It might help that. We don't know that. Uh, but for, uh, so it's possible. We just don't know that. Um, certainly a drug that would reset the immune seesaw could have some benefit, but I don't know that. So uh, it's something we're, we're looking at. We're considering some of those things. As you, as you can imagine, 200 symptoms is a lot of types of symptoms people can get. And, uh, but we really are targeting some of those key ones that I talked about throughout the program. Is there any exclusionary criteria? And do you know when the test results uh, study, when the results will be made available? Yeah, absolutely. So the study is recruiting so quickly that we really expect by the end of the year, we're going to have this thing just about wrapped up. I, I, I think that's probably going to be the case. Uh, so that's not too far away when you consider Susie. June's around the corner. Susie, I was shoveling my snow. It just seems like yesterday. Now it's summertime. And the fall is going to be here in no time. So the year's going to wrap up toot to sweet very quickly. Um, and so we expect by the end of the year. Secondly, um, there are some criteria that make you not eligible. Let's say you're under 18. By the way, you can be older than 18, 60, 65, 70, 75, but you just can't be under 18. You cannot be actively abusing drugs and alcohol. Uh, that's another criteria that come out. But I think for now, what I'll do, I'll just leave it for that. Talk to the team because everyone's got their individual story and I will never be able to cover all the different kind of scenarios that people find themselves in. If you, the team could give you a quick answer, just call them up or email them. We can get those answers right away to you. Okay, there's one, one question here. I don't know if we can answer. If left untreated, do you think these symptoms will worsen over time? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know, nobody knows the answer to that. Uh, I hope not, um, but uh, I, I, certainly, I certainly really hope not. Uh, but, you know, we've had COVID now for, if you can believe it, two and a half years. Um, so we are seeing people who have had COVID for a considerable period of time now, long COVID for a considerable period of time. Um, I hope not, but I've been around a long time in this field. And I don't know if this is necessarily the right metaphor, but I know from previous infections, like Epstein's bar, you know, and, and mononucleosis, things like that, other, other infections over the years. We have had precedent, Susie, where an infection could cause symptoms that last a long time. Now, is that necessarily the case here? I don't know, but we are seeing early signs that this could be a persistent problem for some people for quite some time. I hope that's not true, but I, I got an eerie feeling that it is gonna be the case for some people. Yeah, well, it's been two and a half years for yep. some of us. Yeah, And exactly. although we do show improvement it's uh not back to previous covid uh, right right pace of health right good point so there's a quite a lengthy one here and i don't know if it's uh i'll just read it off and see if you can just maybe yeah uh okay is there a conjecture that ssri might be required longer term to address the immune and brain dysfunction triggered by long COVID. My own experience, 18 months post initial infection with myocarditis and stroke anxiety, depression, and hallucination shows a drastic improvement in memory function after starting fluvoxamine, but I'm also on Aricept. I'm hopeful for your study, but wonder whether it will be able to predict the length or, of, or need recommendation of this kind of medication. You know, I would not be able to make a specific statement or comment about anyone's specific care or specific <laughs> scenarios. I can't comment on that. Uh, but second, but I would say this, is that we decided um, to go with the treatment we went with for the reasons I had mentioned. It treats the symptoms we're trying to treat and affects the immune system, resets the seesaw balance. Um, we purposely did not go with others because we just did not believe it had all the check boxes. Our colleague uh, mentioned fluvoxamine. For those maybe who've never heard this before, or maybe it sounds vaguely familiar, that's a drug that was shown to help people who had acute COVID, 
acute COVID. And the data showed that if you took fluvoxamine while you had acute COVID, that would lower the likelihood you would need to go to a hospital or go to the ICU. That's a different ball game than what we're doing. We're trying to treat long COVID, which is a very different phenomenon than acute COVID. In the long COVID, there may be some overlap, but it's a different ball game. And that's why we went with the treatment we're going with. So I can only really comment on that. And for the reasons that I mentioned, we chose this agent because we think it is in, you know, it, it has those check boxes that we want in a long COVID drug. Good answer. Thanks, Dr. Roger McIntyre. And there's just one more. What are the four or five other suspects of yeah, exactly. um, yeah, causes, <laughs> causes, right? Yeah, exactly. So the immune system is the, is the biggest suspect of the suspect line. The other one, which is, again, these are not mutually exclusive. You can have co-conspirators. So the other one, it could be the virus itself. One of the questions that we're still wondering in the scientific field is whether the virus is directly causing this problem in the brain. It's lingering around and cause damage to the brain directly. So that certainly is a possibility. Thirdly, when people get COVID, they often are short of breath. So maybe their brain got a little starved for oxygen and maybe that caused some lingering problems too. Another, another suspect is, and you all heard this before on the news and so on, that a lot of people who get COVID, what happens, they get blood vessel problems. Their, their blood vessels get a little sticky and they get blood clots. And that's been described, you know, people are getting, some people get these little strokes, even get, you know, heart disease, uh, et cetera. So it's possible that the little blood vessels in the brain got badly affected by COVID and that's affecting their their cognition and their motivation. So it could be the immune system. It could be the virus. It could be because of low oxygen. It could be because of this blood vessel issue. And for some people, quite frankly, uh, Susie, they're on the wrong medication. We see some people who are taking medications they shouldn't be taking because they're making their brain even foggier because they're trying all kinds of things off the internet uh, and stuff like that. So taking treatment can sometimes actually uh, do more harm than good. So I think all those suspects are in the suspect line. I do think the immune system dysregulation is probably the most established um, because of the reasons I think that are abundantly obvious, uh, mm -hmm. but the other ones are certainly also being implicated. Um, have you heard of anyone having less than the severity of their tinnitus taking this medication? Um, we have. Now, I have been using this medication uh, <laughs> clinically and using it in research, uh, for many, many years. Um, and we have seen people who've had vertigo, which means the room spinning around. Tinnitus means your ears are ringing um, type symptoms that have improved with this medication. Um, we call those somatic symptoms, which just simply means symptoms of the body. And those types of symptoms have improved with this medication in some people that I've seen over the years taking it. Uh, that along with pain. Uh, we've seen people's pain, they got pain in their body, get better on this medication. And again, we think that there's not, a, there's not one explanation for everything. I don't want to imply that just one thing accounts for everything. But there are um, threads that kind of stitch through all of this. And one of the threads is the immune system. And so we think if you can reset that, we think it can actually uh, make people's body and mind function better. Okay, I think that pretty much got it. Um, Yannette, I think Leanna could probably help you out with the question of articles, scientific articles. But yeah, um, so Dr. McIntyre, thank you so much for joining us again and for explaining um, everything about the study and answering our questions. And it's always a pleasure. This is the third time that you've been uh, uh, yeah. able to connect with our groups and we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. A pleasure. Thanks, Susie, for all you do. And thanks, everybody. Take good care. And the summertime is here. So let's enjoy it. <laughs> okay, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.